Okay, we're going to talk now about uh, being on mission. So we're talking about what's next in in evangelism and discipleship. This is going to be a little bit longer, uh, but uh, you stick with me because what we're doing is we're combining two topics into one. Uh, a 777 Boeing is the largest passenger jet that can fly or land with one engine, but it needs both engines at full thrust to take off. And the reason I use this is because the mission of the church for it to soar, both evangelism and discipleship need to work in tandem with one another to be at uh, full thrust, to be mission critical. Now, uh, <clears throat> Mission Impossible. Anybody remember the show? Your mission, Jim, should you decide to accept it on Sunday evening, 9 o'clock. The movie, Your Mission, Ethan Hunt, should you decide to accept it. We have a mission and we've got to accept it. And that mission is to seek and to save the lost. Great commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, get out of the salt shaker. Go and make disciples of all nations. It's a command of Jesus. And uh, uh, we do it in two ways. Baptizing, immersing them in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit, and them to obey all that I have commanded you. This should not frighten us because he says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The great commission comes with a great companion. Jesus is with us in it. Nothing to fear. So the, the key is, how do we stay on mission? We don't want to be on mission drift. The passion of the first generation becomes the preference of the next generation. Just stop and think of parents and grandparents. There was a time when there was a real discussion about uh, evangelism, con uh, people being immersed, etc. Just as if 50 years ago it, was, it had a much more visible uh, uh, focus within the church and it's become now less of a passion and more of a preference. Mission drift happens slowly, incrementally, and regretfully it begins with leader. So we need to make sure we're talking about evangelism and discipleship. Throughout the New Testament, we're going to talk about evangelism here. Believers had contact with people who were not believers. The woman at the well. And the, she, in turn, went to talk with people in her village. Philip, Acts chapter 8. He had contact with the who was not a believer. Barnabas, he went to Antioch, where there were many unbelievers. And then he went to get Saul, or Paul, to work in Antioch. And Paul and the Philippian jailer that evening... Not only did the jailer and his family get saved, but then also during that whole visit to Philippi, Lydia, the businesswoman, and the people in her home, they got saved. Peter and the Jews at Pentecost. So Philemon and Onesimus, people deliberately had contact with pagans. And that's where we're going in this. If we're going to... Church has got to challenge their people. Who are you hanging out with that's not a believer? And, and, and listen carefully, it's very important that we remember it's not about inviting people to church. I've got a, he is an unbeliever. He, I'm not going to ask Pat to church. He's not interested in singing to Jesus, somebody he doesn't believe in. We have to invite people into our lives, into our homes who are unbelievers. That's the key, and that's we're, we're going to talk about that. There are four challenges that are going to help us stay on mission when it comes to evangelism. I'm going to give you an equation, and this I call a winning equation. I plus C plus C plus C will equal a Christian. Now, I learned this during my 30 years at the Creek. Indian, Creek, Christian church. Obviously, I taught it to our people over and over and over again. So here we go. That letter I stands for me individually. I must be engaged in reaching lost people. We don't hire Mike the preacher to save people uh, in town. 
We don't hire Jeff to, to reach lost people. We individually, if we wear the name Jesus Christian, I am responsible to be engaged in evangelism. Everybody at First Christian Church, Clinton, Oklahoma, has to take this to heart. Now, let's talk about that a little bit. So here's this Karen again. I'm going to reach a conclusion. I'm going to give you seven common reasons why people say it's not, uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to have a, a friendship with somebody who's a pagan. I'm not going to do it. And here are the reasons. I'm not going to do evangelism. Seven common reasons. There's one. They're afraid. Uh, and what would take away their fear is if we would train them. Could give them some confidence. Don't know how. Don't know how to do this. Well, we're going to train you how to do it. I don't know the answers. Well, we're going to help you know the answers. But you know what? It's good that if somebody at work who's not a believer asks me a question and I don't know the answer, what's a great, great response? Well, you know what? I'll have to get back to you on that one. I, I got to do a little bit of research. I don't know the answer. It's called humility. Just too shy. I'm an introvert. I'm an I on the Myers-Briggs. So I get a get out of witnessing free card. Uh, no, that would not be correct. I'm too busy. I got places to go, people to see, things to do. Uh, it's not my job. I, I'm not going to do it. It's your job. You're the preacher. I can remember uh, 15 years ago or so, the lady at the creek, she came up to me between services, and a uh, lovely lady. Gary, Gary, go up to Community North. My dad, he's in intensive care. He's going to die within two weeks, the doctor said. Please go tell him. He's, he's lost. Tell him about Jesus. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And her jaw dropped, and her eyes got really big, and she goes, you're the preacher. You've got to go. We hired you. Come on now, get up there. Now, she didn't quite use that terminology, but that's what she was implying. I, I could see it on her face. And she kept reasoning with him. Come on, my dad's going to go to hell without Jesus. And I literally said, he would know me from Adam. If I walked in the room, I don't know, she wouldn't know if I, he wouldn't know if I'm the janitor or a doctor or whomever. I'm a stranger to your dad. And I said, as soon as church is over, you get in that car of yours, you drive up there, you go see your dad, you sit on the side of his bed, you take his hand in yours, and you cry, you weep over your dad, and you tell him about Jesus. If he would listen to anybody, it's his daughter. And it is your God-given responsibility to bring your aging, dying dad to Jesus. It's not my job. And you would have thought I told her Jesus had changed his mind and was not coming back. See, a lot of people do not realize this is their responsibility. Every one of us in the room, if we're a Jesus follower, it's our responsibility to bring lost people to Jesus. And then, uh, I'm, I'm just not concerned. We have lost the reality of hell. Our, our country, our culture has become reality that there really is a place of suffering. So th this is worth taking a picture of and using in a sermon. This is something for you to teach in a Bible study. Francis Chan, in his new book, Like Mary Has No Purpose, Many Churches Have Forgotten the Point of Their Existence. They can quickly focus on the complaints of their people rather than on the cries of the lost. We get more emotional over Christians leaving to go to a different church than we do about people dying and going to hell. Something is horribly wrong when we grieve more deeply over people rejecting us than those who reject their Messiah. That is the American church. And we have got to enlighten people to the reality of this. Um, an octopus, uh, I saw this, Lee and I were watching Discovery Channel, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, and we were fascinated. I said, that will preach. And she said, promise me you'll never bring it up. And I said, no, this will preach. And so I'm going to, we're in a church, I'm going to churchify it here, okay? This is what the Discovery Channel said. A boy octopus meets a girl octopus.
and they start dating, they fall in love, they get engaged, and they get married. And then they go on their honeymoon and they do it. You know what I mean? For the first time. They do it for the first time. And the Discovery Channel said that the boy octopus swims off after doing it once and dies. <laughs> Aren't you glad we weren't born an octopus, all right? So, now stay with me. Then the young bride, Mrs. Octopus, she's a young widow on her honeymoon. And then she gives birth to all these baby octopi. And as soon as she has them potty trained and they can fend for themselves, then mom dies. And they eat her. So the female, the mother octopus and the kids eat mom. Now, ladies, aren't you glad you weren't born an octopus? And that's quite literal. And Leah goes, now, how is that going to preach? And I said, watch this. So leave it up to a preacher here. I don't know. I can't auction anything, but I can preach. And uh, so I said, it's simple. Who made that creature? God made that creature. And what did God put in that creature? A passion to reproduce once before dying. And what if every Christian had a passion to reproduce once spiritually before we die? The world would be a completely different place. As a matter of fact, I read the blog every day of Dr. Jim Dennison in Texas. Jim Dennison is a pastor, author, and he's got hundreds of thousands of people strong uh, Jesus follower. And last November, I remember one of his blogs, he said, if every Christian took seriously the Great Commission and a Christian brought and made a disciple and this person made a disciple, brought somebody to Christ and then disciple, he said it would take 33 days to bring everyone on planet Earth to Christ. If every Christian took it seriously. There would be no ISIS. There would be no conflict in Ukraine if we took it seriously. So I've got to be involved. Here's our first C, and it's for the word concern. So am I engaged in this? And I have to be concerned. See, we have to remember that there is something beyond death's door. There, every person draws his or her last breath. And there is something beyond death's door. Now, we know in Scripture, Paul said, and everybody needs to know that address, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord, home with the Lord. That's for the believer. But similarly, for the unbeliever, Jesus in Luke 16, I love that story. He talks about Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus, the beggar, died, and it says the angels carried him to Abraham's side, paradise. And then the very next verse, the rich man also died, and then Jesus said, in hell, where he was in torment. In hell, where he was in torment. If somebody dies without Christ, their last breath here, their first breath, they are in torment. And am I concerned about that? And keep in mind that just like we're home with the Lord, that's not the fullness of heaven. The fullness of heaven happens at the second coming of Christ. I would love to come and teach a seminar on eschatology and times. I, it's, I've written books on heaven. I've written books and done studies, uh, lessons on revelation. It's very easy. Jesus splits the clouds. Revelation 21 says, and I saw a new heaven and a new what? earth, a new earth. It says that many times in scripture. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. This earth is going to be destroyed. And God, bam, instantaneously makes a new earth. And then what we need to understand, we're, so home with the Lord, it gets better. The best is yet to come. Similarly, people already in hell, where they are in torment, it gets worse. And they would say, how so? Here, here's how. Uh, there's going to be a great judgment. Revelation 20. Everybody's standing before the judgment throne. Those who are already in torment, they're going to be called into the presence of God. 
They're going to see God. They're going to hear God. They're going to see Jesus. They're going to hear Jesus. And they're going to realize it was true after all. It was true after all, and their suffering will intensify in that lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Am I concerned about that or not? So when Jesus comes, new heavens, a new earth, final judgment, am I concerned? The letter C is for contact. Do I have contact with pagans or do I just run with my crowd? Do I have contact with unbelievers? Am I building friendships with them? Or am I just hanging out with my tribe? The Confederation Bridge goes from New Brunswick, Canada, uh, excuse me, out to Prince Edward Island. When that bridge opened in 1999 at a cost of $1 billion, there was a great deal of conflict. People on that island did not want it. And there were many people. We don't want that bridge. If people want to come to our island where Anne of Green Gables was written, they can come by a boat, they can land in a plane, or they can swim if they want to get out here. We don't want their kind out here. But likewise, there were people on that island who did want them. We want them in our schools. We want them in our community. We want them in our businesses. So there were there are people who refuse to have contact with individuals who don't believe like, you know, if they don't believe in Jesus, they're not going to look like us, act like us, think like us, speak like us. They're going to be different. Why should I expect them to be good churchy people when they don't even believe in the, the king of the church, Jesus? So we got to decide, am I going to have contact with them or not? We have to build bridges of trust that bear the weight of truth. Think, show, and tell. We have to show people uh, the love, the kindness of God, for we can tell them the plan of salvation. We, gone are the, I can remember in seminary, 1980, we were talking about going calling. You go door to door, inviting people to church. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get shot today if I go knocking on somebody's door, inviting them to church. Um, we, we have to build bridges of trust. When, when we drive over a bridge, what kind of a sign is here on the side of the road? A weight, what? Limit. There's a weight limit. Well, similarly, I know how much I can say to this person uh, that I'm trying to build a friendship with if he or she can handle the truth or not. There comes a time when I've built enough trust in that friendship to where I can share Jesus. And remember, always remember Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Romans 2, verse 4 says, It is your kindness, Lord, that leads us to repentance. So every time you and I do an act of kindness, act of kindness, act of kindness with people, we tell the soil of a hard heart, a closed mind, an act of kindness. It's kindness that brings people to repentance. So with whom, with whom am I building that friendship? Do I have contact with unbelievers? Am I invited into my life or not? And then the next C, I have to be able to communicate with that person the plan of salvation. Communication is essential. Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller, he is an outspoken atheist. He lets people know that. And uh, there was, after one of his shows, a young man went to him with a New Testament, get, wrote a lovely note in it, kind note, and he was later interviewed about that. And he, he did not in any way excoriate that Christian man. He commended him for he was so concerned. And then this is what he said, uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them. The, the royal commands, Jesus taught them, Mark 12, love the Lord your God, Father, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And a neighbor is anybody. Uh, so if my neighbor across the street, Andrew, is an unbeliever and I'm picking up his mail when he and uh, Katie go on vacation, if I mow their lawn when their mower goes out, if I do all the acts of kindness, but I never 
never, ever, ever, never tell him about Jesus and, I let, and he dies and he goes to hell, I really didn't love him. I really did not. And this is true not just for co-workers or neighbors. It's true in families. Um, dad, got two weeks to live. Do you really love him? Do you really love your dad not to tell him about Jesus? And it's true for sometimes a spouse is married to someone who's not a believer. Uh, I run into it all the time with grandparents and their grandchildren are not believers. Do you really love your grandchildren? You better have the Jesus conversation with the grandkids. So uh, this is uh, what I call the six circles. And this is how I was brought to Christ. I was a senior in undergrad. I was raised in Muskegon, Michigan, right here in Lake Michigan. Went to a Dutch Reformed church, sprinkled as a baby. Uh, we were church folk. Uh, but in college, in undergrad, I met my wife-to-be, Leah, who was a PK. Her dad was a, uh, went to Lincoln Christian, well, back then, Lincoln Bible Institute, and started dating Link, uh, Leah and would go home on the weekend to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Pops would be preaching and... And Pops took me under wing, and somebody in that church had me over for dinner. That husband and wife, after the food was put away, took out a piece of notebook paper and drew those six circles right here on a piece of paper and explained it to me. And I knew in 20 minutes my next step. And I, I was right here. I said, I have always believed and I, I want to repent, but I'm ready to publicly declare my need for the Lord. And that evening at 9 o'clock, I was immersed. They said, how about Sunday? I go, no, tonight, Thursday night, right now. Can we go to the church for me to be immersed? And I was a graduating senior in undergrad. That changed my life. And I have taught that to thousands. If you go to this website right here, our website, and you click on uh, free stuff under videos, resources, if you just go to that web right there, that link, you can see a 16 video of me explaining how to close the deal. If we have all of there comes a time when we have to close the deal. Kind of like selling car, or real estate, or whatever. Got to close the deal. And that little 16-minute video, I have trained thousands of people, literally, how to close the deal with that conversation. All right? So, we have to be able to communicate, and then... If we line that up, if I take responsibility and I really have a heart of concern about their eternity and I've got contact with unsaved people and I learn to communicate, closing the deal, I'm going to be able, hopefully, to, to bring somebody to Christ. So before we go into discipleship, you might just want to take a picture of that and later on ask yourself, am I engaged in this? Sure. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, am I concerned? Do I have contact? Can I communicate uh, with that person? Oh, that six, six circle. Mm -hmm, yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, and let me just very quickly. We're all born of a mom and a dad. If something happens to us when we're little, you die and we go to... Okay. That's a child of David. And reach the age of accountability. And if we keep rejecting, rejecting, rejecting Jesus, we're going to die and shh, the wages of sin is death. Okay. All right. But hopefully somebody's going to tell us about Jesus and we're going to believe, we're going to repent, we're going to publicly confess, we're going to be immersed, we're going to live a committed, be faithful to the point of death and I'll give you the crown of life, Revelation 2.10. And we're a part of the church. We're going to keep growing, growing. I'm going to talk about that verse a minute. And like Paul, uh, the time has come. I fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith and I die and I go home to heaven. Got it? And, but however, while I'm here, I can, for whatever reason, reject Jesus. That's committing what? Apostasy. We are not Calvinists. Can reject the faith. Well, I thought you couldn't lose your salvation. There's nothing about losing your salvation. It's an out-and-out -out rejection of Jesus. It's called free 
will. And how long do I have free will? Until the day I die. And I might reject Jesus. And if I utterly reject him, uh, he's nothing more than a historical figure. And I die, I don't have a savior. And to hell I go. And between this line and between this line, that's the here and now, where are you? And I hand a pencil to somebody and go, X marks the spot. Put an X where you are right now. That's in three minutes, the explanation, okay? So, but the, the um, video is more inducive. You want me to go back one more time? Oh, right there? Okay. All right. I've got to be on mission. Yeah. Now, let's talk about discipleship. Once somebody is saved, what about discipling people? We want something for nothing. That's a huge part of our culture. I heard a news broadcast earlier today saying, come on, uh, those Republicans, if they get elected, they're going to it this way. There are basically two types of churches in America today. There's a member-driven church or a mission-driven church. The late Dr. Joe Ellis was one of my main profs at Cincinnati Seminary. He wrote a book years ago called uh, The Church on Purpose. It was published by what was called Standard Publishing. And that book was an inspiration to somebody named Rick Warren, who wrote a book called The What Church? Purpose Driven Church. And he, he uh, acknowledges that in the opening pages of his book. He gives credit to Dr. Ellis. Dr. Ellis said before he died, there are basically, uh, out of four churches, three out of four are member driven. One out of four are mission driven. And here are just some traits of the two. A member driven church is a come and see church. A mission driven church is a go and be the hands and feet of Jesus church. A member driven church talks about Jesus, but a mission driven church lives like Jesus. Member driven a gifted staff who serves us. Mission-driven, everybody has a gift and they are serving. Member-driven, they resist change. Uh, they resist mission. Mission-driven, welcomes change and pursues the mission. Member-driven, happiness is our mission. Keep me happy and I'll stay here. But as soon as you make a decision that I don't like, I'm out of here and I'm going to take my $5 tithe check with me uh, down to that new church. Mission-driven, making disciples is their mission. Not our happiness, but it's reaching people who are not yet followers of Jesus. Member-driven and inward focus. Member uh, Mission-driven, outward focus. Uh, member driven, hey, you better sing music I want. Mission driven, just let me sing. Just let me sing to Jesus. I don't care what it is. So there's a difference, and it has much to do with maturity uh, in Christ.
Let me get that out of your way. I see people taking pictures. All right, so uh, a definition of a Christian, and this is according to Jesus. I hope I never forget this verse. It's Luke chapter 9, and it's verse 23. When Jesus described a Christian saying, if anyone would come after me, he must what? Deny himself. Take up his what? Cross. How often? Daily. And follow after me. And he's not talking about a diamond studded cross necklace. He's talking about being willing to what? To die. This is the definition of a Christian. American Christianity is light. L-I-T-E. I just need a little bit of Jesus to get my get into heaven free card. According to Jesus, that is not correct. Remember the Sermon on the Mount more than once. Hey, narrow is the, or small is the gate, narrow is the road that leads to life. And only how many find it? A few, just a few find it. He said in Matthew 7, uh, many are going to call me Lord, Lord, but they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. We have to remember this is an expectation of Jesus. And we got to talk about that. Uh, if I can reach young people with the gospel by having a more modern service, then bring it on. Bring it on. I'm going to deny. Uh, I love worship. Uh, and my undergraduate degree is in voice performance. I am all about high church. You bring me classical music, Bach, Beethoven, etc., that will float my boat in worship. But you know what? I can deny myself. I, I can pull that up on the website anytime I want, Monday through uh, Monday. But if I'm going to connect with broken, hurting, lost people, it's not going to be through Beethoven, more than likely. All right? So I'm going to deny myself that so that we can create a modern service to connect with broken people who need the hope of Jesus Christ. Um, so what we want to think about is Paul's spiritual progress. In 1 Corinthians, he said, uh, I am the least of the apostles. Now look at when he wrote that. He said in basically 55 AD, I am the least of the apostles. He's comparing himself to 12 guys. And I'm at the bottom of the rung of the ladder of those 12 guys. Now, a little bit later in Ephesians, about five, uh, six years later, he says, although I am the least, I'm less than the least of all God's people. Now he compares himself to all Christians. About five, seven years later. And then right before he dies, he's writing the pastoral epistles. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in uh, verse 15, he says, Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save whom? Sinners of whom I am the worst. I'm the least. So he compared himself to every human being on planet Earth. You see, as he's growing... Uh, or as he's aging, he's growing increasingly aware of his sinfulness. He's maturing. So here's my question. In the last five years, what spiritual... In the last five years, do I look more like Jesus or not? And that has to be a question that we ask of every believer in the local church, especially in their immaturity when they're making demands. I want this, I want that. And just, are you going to look more like Jesus and follow him when he says, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow after him? Are you going to grow up or not? This is an essential question. Now, in order to help people grow, we need to create a spiritual pathway. A discipleship pathway so that people are growing, they're changing. Um, transformation happens in relationship. Hence, your di discipleship pathway has to involve people. And they have to be somehow, someway in a smaller group for their life to be changed. They cannot keep coming just to Sunday morning worship and expect to be formed. Because get into a 
life on life, and they can hold each other what? They can hold each other. And again, if you're just going to have s simple Sunday school, that's what, that's what simply it's going to be. It's going to be simple Sunday school. But if we're going to do life on life, we're going to hold each other accountable to become more like Jesus after coming together. Uh, <clears throat> we need an on-ramp to what I call the groups. This is all about discipleship. So what you want to do is create a menu. We didn't have to eat hamburgers. If we didn't like hamburgers, we could eat a what? A hot dog. There was a choice there, right? And if we didn't like uh, macadamia nut cookies we could have a what we could have a snickerdoodle or a chocolate chip cookie okay we didn't all and if we didn't like potato salad we could pork and bean we had choices on that counter Americans like choices well it's the same thing with regard to learning somebody might say well I don't want to be uh, a band of brothers with three guys I want to be in a group a, a larger group okay well that's all right uh, I want to come on Sunday morning. Well, that's okay. Be in a Sunday school. I want my Sunday school class. Okay, you can do that. But your Sunday school class has to produce godly people. You just cannot come in for some simple old lesson and another perfect attendance pin for your lapel. You have got to come together in a D group, discipleship group, whenever it meets, Tuesday night, Thursday morning, Sunday morning, whenever it meets, and as you leave that gathering, you are more like Jesus than when you walked into that gathering. Does that make sense? A D group, a D group. And we give them a menu of options. It could be on Sunday morning. It could be on Wednesday night. It could be on, I've got a group with 10 guys in it. We meet 6.30 a.m. every Thursday, Panera Bread. We have profound accountability in that group. So we figure out when and where it's going to be. And it's got to involve at least those four fundamental parts. The Word of God. We're not going to be reading Max Lucado's most recent book. It's got to be the Word of God. It has to involve prayer, not only for one another when we're apart, but when we're together. Thursday morning.